So welcome everyone to the Buddhist Path of Awakening Foundations course as we make our way through the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma. And tonight um, we have Dan and Xinyi are going to present on chapter 61. Dan, would you like to take it away? Yes. So this chapter begins part five the journey in terms of the yanas and we begin with the hinayana journey which he goes on to explain that in the uh, nima school of uh, tibetan buddhism that the uh, yanas are divided into the path is divided into nine yanas and the, which is under the umbrella of the three main yanas, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. But the we're beginning with the Hinayana, and this contains two of the nine, which is the Shravakayana, which we will go over tonight, and the other one, the Pratyaka Buddha Yana, which uh, are also in the Hinayana category, but we'll not be going over that tonight. The Shravakayana, he explains, is basic Buddhism. It provides the background for the understanding of the foundations of Buddhism. We are analyzing samsara and the need for nirvana. When you first come to the Buddhism, when you first come to Buddhism, you hear the Four Noble Truths and the teachings of the Hinayana. Shravaka is means in in Tibetan, it's niento, but it means listening and hearing and pro proclaiming. So first you listen to a teacher and the proclaim and then proclaim what you have heard to others and to yourself. And although the Shravakayana, he explains, is the yana of listening and proclaiming, the Shravakas have not yet developed the authority of their own, so they are just passing on what was said by the Buddha. One of the main points, the first point that he covers in the Shravakayana is that it begins with the notion of freedom and how we can relate to that freedom. And we come to the notion of freedom because we are dealing with the Four Noble Truths, which tells us about the inherent dissatisfactory, dissatisfactoriness of, in life or that suffering exists. And the second noble truth covers the causes of suffering. And the third noble truth tells us that there is cessation to suffering. And that is through the Eightfold Path, which is the fourth noble truth. But the main important, the important part of the Shravakayana is that first we, in relating to this question of freedom, freedom from, from suffering, freedom from liberation, from the persistent stories and narratives that we tell ourselves. That's what the freedom is from, because these narratives and thoughts that we reify are the cause of our suffering, that we should try to save others first and not be concerned with saving ourselves. The Shravakayana states that we should save ourselves first. This should not even be a question about saving other people's first. And this is known as individual salvation or sosotarpa. We do not try to help others because we are going through immense transformations and confusion ourselves and the danger is if we blindly rush off to help others that we will contribute further to their ignorance and misconceptions as he calls it the further garbage to the people that we are trying to help and we do not want to create further chaos and mess so the notion of skillful help is a very strong point in buddhism he explains and continues throughout the nine yanas 
and he explains this by saying it is necessary to know who actually needs help and to differentiate that between who is just asking for help. Knowing who to help is the important thing. We should save ourselves, you should save yourself, and evolve on the path. If you try to save others before that, you may destroy yourself and destroy the other person. And the classic example of that is that if there's a problem on the airplane and the oxygen masks come down, you must put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can even attempt to help other people. So one way we do this, the first way he explains, is through renunciation. And through renunciation, we experience loneliness. By means of renunciation, he says, we cease causing harm to others and we refrain from harm. We are developing a sense of aloneness or loneliness. We are constantly being seduced by one form of entertainment or another in all kinds of things, in all kinds of ways. So it is possible, not possible to just renounce and be done with it. We have to contain ourselves within our own loneliness so that we do not pollute the world. It may be extraordinarily painful, he says, but that is part of the teachings. You begin to realize the truth of suffering. He goes on to say that loneliness provides us with an immense sense of openness, simplicity of being by ourselves is very powerful. We renounce entertainment at all levels and therefore we can focus on spiritual practice. And though we have to take care that while we're renouncing our distractions and our forms of entertainment, we don't go overboard and renounce things that are necessary to keep us healthy. And he uses a quote from the Buddha that says, on one occasion, the Buddha said to Ananda that if you don't take good care of your body, there will be no body. And if there is no body, there is no Dharma. And if there is no Dharma, there is no liberation. So renouncing that constant entertainment approach is very important. It's based on a combination, we're renouncing the entertainment that is based on a combination of neurotic arrogance and indulgence. Indulgence in the distractions, the entertainment, all the many ways we can distract ourselves from being alone and present in the, in the here and now. And this is important because we begin to see the deceptions, our misperceptions, the garbage, as he calls it. And when we can renounce, renounce those things and understand being aloneness, we do not cause further harm to others because we don't perpetuate the misconceptions and the ignorance, right? He says one of our problems though in this is that we are unable to bear the thought of being alone. Being yourself is very lonesome. When we really feel lonely, it's almost unspeakable, ineffable, beyond words. And then he goes on to say that aloneness is really a bit too euphemistic because it's what we, it's a word that we use when we do not want to talk about loneliness. And in being alone, you do not have to pretend anything or to pretend to be anything or be anything other than yourself, being yourself is lonesome. People do not like it. You would like to visit your friends. You would like to be distracted. You would like to say how fine you were doing. You would like to talk to somebody if you're feeling lonely, but in doing so, we're just finding another way of entertainment or distracting ourselves from the renunciation and the simple simplicity of being alone. He says, loneliness is the essence of the Shravakayana. It takes our breath away. It's so refreshing, he says. It's excessively refreshing. 
and very romantic, actually. He says, loneliness is very touching. It makes people write poetry, compose music, and become highly artistic and creative. And he goes on to describe the view of the Shravakayana. And that's the Four Noble Truths. You want to get out of this particular disease called samsara. He says you are freaked out by it and are relieved to hear that there is a way out of hell and misery. And this way is individual salvation, the liberation that we are looking for. The Shravaka understanding of reality is by means of prajna or discriminating awareness. A person begins to realize the non-existence of the individual ego, the I. It's the I who wants to attain individual salvation, and that is the problem. This is the first category of non-ego, the problem of the I. It is based on rejecting any possibility of realizing anything beyond itself self-absorption in order to get rid of pain you have to get rid you have to get rid of the one who experiences the pain but this does not mean that you should go out and commit harikiri or destroy yourself he said for that too would be based on the existence of the eye he says the approach to the shavakayana is much more sophisticated than that Right? So we don't destroy the notion of the I by destroying ourselves, literally. It's much more sophisticated. Overcoming the ego of the self is a very sophisticated way of going beyond the obstacles and hang-ups and blockages. But at this point, you have not transcended the second aspect of ego, the ego of dharmas, or the belief in external reality. Right? We have already come, overcome the I, and he explains it as, but we still have the am being left hanging around. And that is the way we relate to the external reality. And we still believe in that, that the external reality phenomena, the egos of Dharma, still have their inherent uh, existence. Our, this is our misconception. Right? He said, actually, though, there is a good side to the ego of the dharmas because believing in the external reality helps us to realize the egolessness of the self. He says, we hang on to the ego of dharmas, the belief in external reality and its inherent existence to eliminate the ego of self. He says, it's not a bad approach. Right? And he, he sums up, finalizes it with the paragraph that at the Shravakayana level, by using one aspect of ego, a subtler form of ego, you try to eliminate crude ego completely. So at this point, you still believe, because we still believe in the external reality, the ego of the, the dharmas, at this point, we still believe in some kind of continuity, the continuity of the, which is the illusion of continuity of the external reality. While, just to explain this, you know, while, while we perceive the external reality as being real and not being, uh, you know, not being empty of some inherent existence, that we perceive it to have a continuity, while it is really just moments in time, you know, there is no real continuity to it, but we have the illusion of its uh, continuity of existence, because we feel that the that the external reality really does have an internal, uh, this inherent existence. He says, you believe in the contu continuity of time, that's a reality, the continuity of atoms, which is a reality, 
and the continuity of subtle consciousness as reality. And that is all based on not understanding the egolessness of the external reality, the, in, the lack of inherent self-existence. So we have the illusion that it is a continuous existing you know, phenomena of uh, the external dharmas or categories of experience. And with that, I will hand it over to Jinyi. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, just want to express my thanks uh, to John and everyone else for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to continue with the discussion on egolessness, starting with a section titled Atoms and Instant. So at the Shravakayana level, um, the approach to realizing the truth of egolessness or no self is, at Trump Rinpoche put it, to break things into smaller and smaller parts and reduce them into individually existing atoms or particles. And um, I just want to note that um, it is a very intellectual approach um, in that the Shavakas break things down, they analyze it, and they, through that method, come to the truth of egolessness. And our mistaken habit usually is to perceive things in a very solid manner, which brings unnecessary suffering. And um, I want to also uh, mention some quotes in a book that we read for the Tuesday class, um, The Progressive Stages of the Meditation on Emptiness by Kenpo Tsuchin Gyamso, where he gets more into the details of why the understanding of um, egolessness is very important, um, which I find to be a helpful addition to our discussion here. So in Kenpo Tsuchin Gyamso's book, he said that our instinctive emotional attachment or clinging to a vague notion of self is the source of all our suffering. From the idea of self comes that of other. It is from clinging to self that the idea of other arises and desire, hatred, and delusion arise. From these unhealthy mental states arise actions motivated by them and their results, meaning the karmic consequences, the results take the form of all kinds of suffering, which one cannot escape as, as long as one clings to the skandhas as if they were the self. So essentially what he's saying here is that because we cling to the notion of self and other, and because we have this um, dualistic perception, we get into the game of um, whether consciously or unconsciously accepting certain things and rejecting certain things. And we start the game of hope and fear, which then give rise to afflictive emotions such as desire, hatred, jealousy, pride, etc. And because we have these unhealthy mental states, we also are propelled to say or do things that are going to be harmful for us and others in both the short term and the long term. So you can really see how the whole samsara unfolds from this very fundamental mistake about the existence of self. So in other words, um, if fundamentally we're mistaken and there's actually no self to begin with, then it goes without saying that all our efforts in preserving, protecting ourselves are all going to be misdirected. And what we we'll do, what we do will not bring us real satisfaction. Instead, we only get further and further entangled in samsara. So with that in mind, um, you can see how that first glimpse of egolessness, um, even at a Shravakayana level, is a profound discovery. Now, back to our text. Um, at the Shravakayana level, the approach to egolessness is to reduce things into individually existing atoms or particles. And when you think about it, um, it is not unlike the scientific understanding of reality, at least from my point of view. Um, we all learn in school that things are made of atoms, and when a scientist split the atoms, they find the quarks, etc. But the mere knowledge of that is not enough to end our suffering, right? Um, we all know that things are made of atoms, for example, but um, when we look at our body, 
do we actually feel that we are made of these floating particles, which are 99.9% 99, 99 .9 made of empty space? Um, we don't because of our habitual tendencies. But here, um, what I find to be very interesting is that Trump Rinpoche gives us a taste of what the world looks like and feels like when you actually experience the truth of egolessness. So in this chapter, he said that there is some gooiness to everything that exists, your own body, your own intellect, your own time concept, your own concept of security, death, eternity, and all kinds of things. Imagine drinking a glass of water and thinking that it is not one solid thing quenching your thirst, but little atoms that make you think in your equally spotty mind that your thirst will be quenched. Everything, the whole of life, begins to change at that point. So how do we come to that kind of experiential taste of reality? And Trump just said that at a Shravakayana level, the method they use is uh, by applying mindfulness. So in the book, he said that in a Shravakayana level, you apply mindfulness to everything that you do. You're always practicing mindfulness. When you walk, you see that neither the place you walk nor the walking itself is solid. When you breathe, you see that it is not really one breath, but questionable breath. You see everything with microscopic vision. And I want to jump ahead a little bit to later in this chapter, where Trumper Bache talks more about the meditation practice at the Shravakayana level. So um, on page 476, he said that meditation is primarily pure shamatha practice, which allows individual to realize the egolessness of individuality. By concentrating on something such as the breath, you begin to develop a kind of hollowness in your individual message. So why is mindfulness the approach to egolessness? Because our mind when it's not trained, when it's untamed, it's usually full of all kinds of comments, dramas, and everything is about me, which only solidifies the construction of ego. So even though ultimately the ego is non-existent, um, because we're so busy with our thoughts and emotions, we just don't see the hollowness of ego. Therefore, to actualize egolessness, the first, th uh, first thing we do is to slow down our mind. And we do so by resting our mind on something such as the breath. We notice our, uh, our mind wanders off. Um, what we do is that we simply return to our breath again and again. And I believe everyone of us here have the experience that with more and more practice of shamatha, gradually the mind becomes more still, at least at times. And there are certain points where we glimpse a gap in our subconscious gossip. And that gap, um, that glimpse is very powerful. Because at this point, as Trump Rinpoche said, there is a general loss of reference point. You begin to experience a feeling of no anchor, the possibility of no peg. Therefore, by practicing shamatha, what is really happening is that our ego slowly loses its grip on us. As he said here, there's nothing holding you. When you're mindful, you're exposing the egolessness of individuality. And because there is less centralization of me, our mind becomes more present. Um, we become more available to the world in general. Um, as Trump Rinpoche said here, when you're mindful, if you're opening a Japanese fan, your mind is completely occupied with how you are going to open your fan. So the ego of individuality has to be taken away from you. And this is precisely what mindfulness means, taking yourself out. This is why we work on the out breath alone to take, our, to take your mind out. But being the first discovery of egolessness, there are, of course, limitations to the Shavaka's understanding of reality. 
and that limitation here um, is there is still a reference point. As Trumbertree put it, um, while they question, meaning the Shravakas question the solidity of ex existence, they still believe that atoms exist at the finest level of time. So at the finest, finest level, some reference points still, still exist. Um, in other words, um, the possibility of shunyata has not come yet. Um, shunyata means emptiness. Um, it is a main doctrine at the Mahayana level, which will come next. And at the Mahayana level, even the finest particles are said to be non-existent. There's just no reference point. Still, that first glimpse of egolessness is very powerful. And it is the first stage when um, a practitioner begins to have a true understanding of emptiness. As Trump Rinpoche said, um, as ordinary people experiencing things in the ordinary way, and as people who have never heard of such a thing as shunyata, the approach of breaking things down into atoms is something that we can actually learn. It can be taught to the person in the street can be told to feel that the chair you're sitting on is made out of little atoms and that is not solid and the mind you're thinking with is made of little atoms and that you're not really thinking about it breaking things down in that way is a very powerful thing to do so the next section um, that um, we're going to cover in this chapter is about four levels of students at a hinayana level and these are four orders of social sharpest, um, categorized according to the particular Hinayana vow they have taken. Um, each type has a masculine and feminine form, making eight categories in total. The first category here is Nyane or Nyanema, uh, meaning someone who is uh, about to become a student of Buddhism. Um, they're about to take a vow, they're sort of rehearsing their vows. Um, the second category, big category, is Genyan or Genyanma. And this means someone um, who has actually made a commitment of treading on a path. Um, it is someone who has taken refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And uh, I think most of us know this, but I'm just going to make the point that um, the Dharma reference here has a meaning different from the, uh, the Dharma when we discussed earlier in this chapter about the egolessness of Dharma. Um, here the Dharma means the truth. So um, when we take refuge in the Dharma, um, we take refuge in that um, which transform our mind and allows us to see things as they are. We also take refuge in the Buddha as the awakened one who has actualized this truth. We take refuge in the Sangha um, these are the people or beings who accompany us on the way to the state of liberation, such as our teachers, our spiritual friends, and fellow travelers on the path, such as all of us here. And he also discussed um, that um, at this level, you can take some or all of the five Buddhist precepts, and these precepts are optional. Uh, meaning you can choose to take them or not. Um, early in the book, uh, Trump Rinpoche talks more in length about the five precepts. So the idea is that you should pay heed to what you're doing. Um, just to add my commentary here, um, taking these precepts, um, the idea is based on cultivating mindfulness. Um, it is an attitude of non-aggression. And also by taking the precepts and the vows, you do accumulate merit. So the five precepts are, the first is not to destroy life or not to take life. The second is not to lie. The third is not to steal or not to take something not given to you. The fourth is celibacy. And sometimes it is framed as not to engage in sexual misconduct, which is not entirely the same. Um, the fifth is not to drink alcohol or, or um, not to take intoxicants. And the idea is that you can progress through these five precepts. Um, you can even take 
one or two or all five of them for just one day. Um, so really you're uh, committing to what you're capable of. Um, the third category is getso or getsuma. Um, this means novice monks or nun who have taken 10 basic vows. And the fourth is gelong or gelongma. And these are monastics with full ordination. The big shu or the monks um, usually have around 253 rules. And the big shunis or the nuns keep around 364 rules. I remember when I first heard they have these hundreds of rules to keep. It's like nobody's gonna do it. But um and you might think that living with so many rules must be very restrictive and confining, oppressive, etc. But um at least according to Trump Rich, it is quite the opposite because he said the idea of such rules is not to complicate your life, but to enrich your life. Um, so these rules provide a container for your discipline, contemplation, meditation, and because you have this 200 and 300 rules governing your life, actually, it makes your life very simple, um, because how you lead your life is completely laid out. Um, and the next section we're getting into um, discussion is the activities of Shravaka. So um, this is a similar point that Dan presented before. The activities of shavakas are those of purely working for oneself, but we mustn't look down upon that. Rather, it is that by, um, it is that you begin. It is it is that you begin by dealing with the closest person you have in the world. If you try to deal with somebody over there and you forget to deal with yourself. You find yourself destroying both you and that person altogether. So as Dan explained before, um, beginning by dealing with ourself is not really a selfish attitude. Um, by working with our own mind, what we're really doing is by gain is that by doing so, we gain a much better understanding of the cause of our own suffering, which is also the causes of other sentient beings suffering. So Without that very fundamental understanding of the cause of suffering, if we try to help others, um, it might bring confusion at this point. Um, you might feel that you're doing a good deed, you're helping the other person, but in the long run, it may not bring that person real benefit. Um, but as we um, practice shamatha, as we understand the Shavakayana teachings, um, what's really happening is that we gain a much better insight um, of the truth of suffering, of what is causing the suffering, and how to bring about the cessation of suffering. And having developed that insight allows us to be of better help to others later. And a common analogy used in the Buddhist teaching is that of a mother without arms, uh, which is us sentient beings um, trying to save her child who is drowning in the river. So the idea is that um, even though the mother really loves her child and very much don't want the child to suffer, um, all she can do at that point is cry because the mother cannot truly help her child at this point. And even later on at the Mahayana level, it is said that a new bodhisattva, uh, meaning a person who is courageous enough to take the vow to liberate all sentient beings, um, even for someone who has just taken this vow, it is better to make strong aspiration to help all sentient beings instead of putting all the person's effort into charity work. So lastly, the section uh, we're going to cover in this chapter is about the achievement of the Shavaka. Um, which has two categories. The first is the wearing out process, meaning that with proper shamatha, you no longer have the occurrence of conflicting emotions. And the second achievement is non-birth, meaning that such emotions not only do not occur, but they do not plan seeds for the future. They will never be born again. And 
He also said that the ultimate attainment of the practice of wearing out and non-birth is called aharship. And this may be stating the obvious here, uh, but you certainly do not need to attain aharship before studying and practicing the teachings of Mahayana. And also, Hinayana is not a stage where you get past and forget about um, as we study higher teachings. Rather, even at the highest teachings, such as the tantric teachings, um, they still have the Hinayana teachings as their foundation or their ground. As Trump Rinpoche reminded us, we should never forget the Hinayana. So I just want to end with this quote here at the end of the chapter. The Hinayana is real Dharma. It is no lesser. It is the first step of how to teach the common ordinary person how to experience the real truth of Sadharma. You can teach it to your children and develop them in that way. Later, you can teach them the Mahayana and the Vajrayana. So that's the end of my presentation tonight. Um, thank you for listening. And is there any complaints or questions or comments? You're welcome. Wonderful, Dan and Chini. Thank you. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, one is about atoms. That the fundamental teaching that everything is made up of atoms. I mean, this was conceived, you know, about what the Buddha lived in the fifth uh, to fourth century BC. They didn't have any notion of atomic particles. <laughs> you know, that, like we do um, from modern science. And what they were talking about is the dharmas. That's, that's been translated as atoms. And what it really means is um, atoms of experience. So in any moment, um, you're seeing the brown of the wood in your life. You're hearing the sound of this voice. All of these things are momentary experiences. And they have an atomistic quality or a momentary, you know, unitary quality. Everything that we experience in the moment is made up of all of these different particles, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Now that I mention it, you can feel your bottom on the cushion and thoughts. And all of these things come to us in the moment, momentarily. Um, there was a... Uh, Great, I mean, a wonderful teacher. He was very <laughs> intellectual. His name was Herbert Gunther early on. He was one of the first people that I ever read about Buddhism um, because there wasn't a lot back in those days to read. And he called these things um, atoms of experience. They're not atoms in the sense of modern physics, but that our whole ego, our experience of our life and our self, is made up of these little atomistic experiences, which are listed. Um, I've sent to you the list of, uh, of the, all the dharmas, like the 75 dharmas, and you've got a list of 10 physical dharmas, I mean, 12 physical dharmas. You know, there's, no, there are 10 physical dharmas, and then there's the mental ones. So there's the eye and the object of the eye, the ear and the object of the ear. These are all dharmas of experience, moments atoms of experience um, and then all the thoughts that can arise pride anger whatever in the moment they are atoms of experience mental experience so when we deconstruct this belief in a self what we're realizing if we come into the moment and that teaching of going out with the breath and resting in space the space of here and now and we begin to see this momentary, fragmentary experience of reality that we have now. One other thing about um, the uh, 
vows that people take that uh, Xinyi mentioned, you know, the five for the, uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, yeah, that's the Genyen or Genyenma, um, taking refuge in the jewels and they're about to get some precepts, the five, don't kill, don't steal, don't have improper sex, whatever that means anymore. Um, and uh, what else? Um, fourth one, I forget the fourth one. The fifth one is uh, not to drink alcohol. What's the fourth? Uh, you know, Did you mention uh, not to lie? Lie, no, that's it, not to lie. That's uh, the second one. And what they say, the, the standard joke is that to break the fifth one, which is to consume intoxicating substances, then you'll break the other four too. <laughs> so, but when we we have um, programs, month long meditation programs, uh, called datans or a week long called a week tun, and at the beginning of the day, every day, people can take these vows, these five vows, or not. Um, so, if for instance you know that you're going to have some alcohol later in the day, in the morning when you are given the opportunity to take the five vows, you just don't say the one about not drinking. So you haven't taken it. But if you do take a vow and then break it, then you're supposed to go and confess to your meditation teacher. So for instance, um, here's a common one uh, at a big daton, you know, maybe there are 40, 50 people or more. And you, in the morning you get up and you go into the shower and you realize you forgot to bring your soap in the soap dish, but someone has left their soap sitting in the soap dish in the shower, the built-in one. Well, if you use that, you're breaking the vow of not to use what isn't offered because nobody offered that to you. And then you're supposed to go to your preceptor, your meditation instructor, and confess. Now, the confession is not a matter of Christian or Jewish confession, like I'm a terrible person, I committed a crime. It's really bringing it present. That's what the me meaning of the confession is, to make it present so that it isn't this hidden thing that we're, we're ashamed of, um, but to really acknowledge it. And the, I mean, the meditation teacher, can you imagine how they feel? They, they could care less. You know, oh, you use somebody else's soap, terrible person, <laughs> or whatever it might be. So anyhow, that's the whole idea is awareness. And it's the same thing with the atoms, the so-called atoms. I think atoms is a misleading inter interpretation of the word. The word is dharma um, in, uh, uh, in Sanskrit. Dharma has many, many meeting, meanings in the Indian tradition. Um, in our Buddhist tradition, it has the meaning of teachings. It also has the meaning of particles of existence, particles of existence. And there are things like sights and sounds and the, the color red and the color blue, the sound, you know, of a musical note and the smell of onions and whatever it might be. All of these things are dharmas, particles of existence, of experience. And that when we begin to become really aware and awake in the present moment, we begin to become aware of all of these particles of existence and realize that we were putting names on them, this of a person of Shinyi or Mel or Philip or whatever, and, and lumping all these particles of experience that arise in the moment, moment to moment, under a name. And when we do that, we begin to get very confused. We begin to lose track of reality. And when we begin to become more aware, sensitive to our environment by going out with the breath, here we are in the present moment, awake, aware, without those names of it, we begin to experience a very different kind of world, the world of egolessness. So sorry to go on so long. This is beautiful material. Thank you both. You did a great job. Just want to add, add some. Hmm? I'm sorry. No. Yeah. If if I can add something to that to to the or just emphasize more what what John was saying about the importance of uh, you know coming back from dreams and, and you know we talk about this 
during our meditation all the time, right? The instruction, you know, when we find ourselves wandering off into thought, come back to the present moment, recognition of that. The, 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 the realization of the egolessness of Dharma, or, you know, the particles of experience, that, that's not realizing that. It's what gives rise to the illusion of a continuity that isn't there. And that continuity is one of the, that illusion of continuity is one of the major ways we create a fiction, we create a story, you know, we create this, um, you know, illusion that, that things are, you know, you know, this flow that doesn't exist because they are just really particles of moment by moment here and now experience that we put together and, cre and create this illusion of continuity. And that is one of the big fictions that we, you know, when we realize we come back to present awareness, when we realize the, the illusion of that continuity, you know, which is, we can look at continuity as a story that we're telling, right? And so coming back to present moment awareness is, is, is a part of that whole, um, you know, misperception about the ego of Dharma. So. Any comments, questions? This is, really deep. this is really deep stuff, really deep. I yeah. love it though. But we are here right now. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, you know, you did uh, a reading from uh, the, the Tuesday night text, the way the Bodhisattva. Can you tell me what, what the page numbers or what chapter that was from? Um, so I believe I, uh, read the, um, book from, by, um, Kempo Tsauchim Gyantso. Oh, uh, so not, okay. But I, I can find that for you. Not this much. No, the page, um. No, not or, not okay. That. No, okay. wrong book. Wrong book. Okay. Well, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> this one. So. But Barry's holding it up. I don't have that one. Okay. It's a great one. Progressive okay. stages of meditation on emptiness. That's okay. what we're doing for the Tuesday class. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I think I remember hearing like a couple weeks or a month ago that we're finished the one book and moving on to the next. So, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> like, um, Yeah. Th so th thank you for that. Yeah, I do recommend because um, on Tuesday, the topic is also the Shavaka Yana. Um, their understanding of emptiness, which uh, I find to be very helpful and very deep um, yeah. and helps my understanding of this material as well. And um, the quote that I read, I'm not sure exact page number because um, I have the electronic version, um, but um, but I can send that to you. Just well, you have to be careful. There are at least three editions and each one of them has different pagination. Okay. Okay. Um, progressive stages of meditation on emptiness. Looks like I have to place exactly. Progressive. Yeah, looks like I have to place another Shambhala order. <laughs> so. it, it it is available in audiobook. I found it in audiobook. And it's also available in uh, uh, PDF for your reading on your Kindle and a paper, obviously. Okay. Progressive. Kempo Tsultiyasso was an interesting uh, teacher. 
Trungpa Rinpoche um, was very critical of a lot of Tibetans. He felt that they wanted to give Americans sort of this exotic, you know, tantric stuff that would, you know, capture them and, uh, if, in, in, what's the word, uh, you know, beguile them. And uh, he didn't like that. Uh, he even, you know, felt that way about teachers whom he liked, like, for instance, uh, Kalu Rinpoche, uh, who lived up in Vancouver, was a lovely man, but he gave his students the most exotic stuff. And we were so gullible that we, you know, we thought, gee, if it's really exotic like this, it's going to be really powerful and do something for me. And he wanted people to start at the beginning. So he was very careful about whom he allowed to teach to his American students. And many people that you would expect that he would have allowed, great teachers, he didn't. He, he entertained them, he hosted them when they were here, and he didn't give them opportunity to teach. Kenpo Tsultum Gatso, he did. He said he, he trusted Kenpo Tsultum Gatso. He said that he is a real yogi. And that was a compliment. <laughs> Mel, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I'm just taking it all in. I love it. Thank you. Okay. Philip, did you? Um, yes, three things directly to what you had just said. That explains about Tolkien Urgen, because uh, from my understanding, he was the most liberal of all the teachers when it came to pointing out instructions. He believed very strongly everybody should get them straight off. Um, totally at odds with Chogum Chongpa's approach. Second thing is to Dan and Shani, thank you so much for these teachings. That was so well done. And the third thing is, I really enjoyed thinking about Chogum and Trungpa's thoughts on loneliness here and aloneness, um, because that comes up a lot um, when we're talking about letting go of our ego, and it comes up a lot with renunciation. Um, and it's nice to think about this from the other side, this line, for instance. Loneliness is very definite. You have no expectations. Really, what could be more wonderful than that? There's this great saying about expectations. Expectations are act one of a play with many acts. And the title of that play is Disappointment. <laughs> so, yeah. And then he goes on to say, uh, you do not have to pretend anything or be anything other than yourself. That's just lovely. Who would not want to be there? And he finishes this section, excessively refreshing, very romantic, actually. Loneliness is very touching. It makes people write poetry, compose music, and become highly artistic and creative. So that's one of the things to look forward to if you can sort of strip away all of the garbage that we you know, we just walk around with our feet, with our feet of clay, and we could dance. Well, thanks for your teaching, Shinyi and Dan. That was great. Sarah. Yes. Uh, thank you, John, for explaining the atoms that maybe they're referring to, these atoms of experience. I understand that, but I feel kind of stubborn because um, seeing physical atoms <laughs> and everything as this like build of different atoms really helps me understand egolessness in a way. Um, but like maybe even more so than these atoms of experience help me understand egolessness. Like um, uh, the whole idea of the cloud never dies. You know, there's just all these atoms that are kind of like joining other atoms and this is constant um, transformation. 
kind of like erases the boundaries of like a separate entity. So I'm curious, could we, could we go with both? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. One thing this chapter did for me was it made the in meditation instruction <clears throat> of going out with the breath and dissolving into space much more meaningful than it had been before I read this chapter. Because um, what I'm beginning to experience and probably by describing it, you give it away, is that you go out with the breath and dissolve into this space, and it's hollow, it's empty of self, and it's full of all of these experiences, you know, sights and sounds and smells, and it's very, it's a way into egolessness, going out with the breath, dissolving into space, one lets go of one's interpretations, one's likes and dislikes and labels of the things that are in that space. And I just find that it, um, it's very powerful for, somewhat anyhow, for me. And I'm offering it, see if, you know, you might either have had or, I think that there's a reason that he gave, Trungpa Rinpoche gave us that instruction about going out into space. And I want to tell you too, that I've been studying for 20 years now with a man named Kempo Mandrel, who at one point was the head teacher of all of the Rinpoches for the Nyingma sect. He's very, very learned. And he came years ago, more than 20 years ago, to what's now called Mount Drala Mountain Center used to be called Rocky Mountain Dharma Center up in outside of Fort Collins. It's on about 900 acres. Um, it's a Dharma Center and there. You can go there and there were programs that run. And he came and taught there. And I was shocked when he gave meditation instruction and gave this very same instruction of going out with the breath and dissolving into space. So I think, you know, he's primarily a, what this called a Dzogchen teacher means great perfection teacher, which is the end of the Nyingma path. It's very advanced. I think that that was a Dzogchen teachings that Trungpa Rinpoche gave to us. And then that Kempo Namdol gave all on his own years after Rinpoche had died. It was, I never heard anybody else teach it. So I think that we have something very profound in this teaching of going out with the breath and dissolving into space. And here we are. Yeah, I also really like his um, explanation or like how he framed our shamatha vipassana practice here. I just find it to be a very accurate depiction of what is happening. And um, further to John's point, I feel that, um, so maybe like a side note, um, the shamatha vipassana practice that we're doing at and Trump Rinpoche encourages students to do um, is quite unique because um, usually um, outside of Trump Rinpoche's uh, Sangha, when you speak to a Tibetan teacher, for example, and you ask them like, what's the shamatha practice? They will say, you just focus on the breath, but both in breath and out breath or a single object or something um, to essentially concentrate on that. But um, it's quite different from the shamatha vipassana practice we're doing, where we only have a very light um, awareness on the out breath, and it's much more relaxing and open. So, I don't know. That's uh, just something I would throw in there. I think that this practice of going out with the breath and dissolving into space is leading us to an understanding of egolessness in the practice. Right. One way that's manifested for me is, is, is that in 
the breath going out and expanding into the space of awareness, thinking the, you know, the space itself is the awareness. Awareness is happening. Has led me to statements like that, and you know, and you know, consciously thinking of it in this way, that since it's the space of awareness, it's not I'm having thoughts, I'm feeling this, I'm experiencing this, I'm seeing this, is that thoughts are happening, sights are happening, sounds are happening. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's my experience of what you're saying. And to add to that, and particularly to what you're saying, Sarah, one of the nice things about that is every living thing on the planet breathes, and they breathe with the same molecule. And those oxygen molecules, they've been unchanged for thousands and thousands of years. It's not to say they're not empty on some level, um, mm -hmm. but these things are true. Dan, are you saying that a, a thought that maybe I'm maybe having is not my thought, it's, it's just a thought? Yes. Just it's like maybe a collective thought? Or it's just yeah, a I don't know thought? If, yeah, I don't know if collective is the exact right description, but directionally, you're, yes, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're being led into a very new world, the world of egolessness. And we're being sort of introduced to it and told that it's there and given a little push. And that it's very powerful, can be for us and, and life changing. I think I'm saying the obvious from the Buddhist teachings point of view. But it's still helpful to hear it. And it feels so different, you know? This this like this like we're standing on the edge of a new world. Same old world, but different. Anybody else? We still have 20 minutes. Judy, did you have something? You're muted. No, I just had an itch on my eyebrow. Well, <laughs> we'll turn it into something. <laughs> no, it's only an itch on my eyebrow. <laughs> uh I have some more questions, but I don't want to double dip until everyone that has a question has a chance to. We've got all this space. Go ahead, Jen. Awesome. Okay. You know, uh, the, the last time that I was part of one of these of the class, I think this is my second one, uh, was probably a month or so ago. And I, it's kind of the same comment and I would like to hear people's reflections on it. And it's something I keep bumping into. I bumped into it four times just in today's lessons, but it is, it's fascinating to me that my religious fundamentalist upbringing is coloring what I'm learning here, even though it's a vastly different thing. And it's that I'm reading things really literally and absolutely, and I'm bumping into problems with that because I keep, you know, I'm hearing egolessness and I, and, and, and like, I, I get the concept as much as anyone who's really new at this can get, but what I'm bumping into is 
the only way to be truly, truly egoless is to be dead or to be something close to psychosis, like something complete, or, uh, or something close to psychosis where you just like lose all sense of yourself. So if someone could help me out and, and what, you know, someone else in my life, you know, who, who isn't, who isn't a Buddhist, but she said that the, the objective is not ego dissolution because that isn't healthy. It's make it so ego is not in the driver's seat of your life. And that's something I find helpful, but I wanted, I'd love, I'd love to hear from some Buddhist leaders, you know, our experts, facilitators of like, and that's only one thing, you know, I, I run, as I said, I ran into this absoluteness of, but that doesn't feel right. And I kind of feel like I'm being contrary in my head, you know, uh, like, like rebellious or something. So, and yeah, okay. I'll stop talking and I'm interested to hear people's feedback. No Just really quickly, Janet, it might help you to use the word egocentric. What you're trying to deconstruct is egocentricity, the okay. concept that you're the center of the universe, that you're the center of all time and space, that there's probably something fundamentally flawed with that outlook. That's the right. suggestion. That is helpful. That's really helpful. And I also would add, um, Jane, I think this uh, issue that you bring up, like you have this interpretation from your past background and like cultural understanding is extremely common. I think everyone has that when they first try the path. I remember when I was um, first learning about like concept, concepts and um, teachings, I had a very strong resistance of the idea of confession. Yes. Um, yep. <laughs> That's a big one um, yes. for everyone, especially a if you word. Word. Yeah. Um, the way of the Bodhisattva, there's a lot of mentioning of sin. So it's like, it's like trigger words to me. Um, I think it does get better at some point as you um, listen to more teachings and have a deeper understanding of what the words means. Um, I think ultimately the understanding and the experience, the experience um, of egolessness, for example, can't really be described in words, but that's the only way people communicate. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to say that like words is the way to get to an experiential understanding. Um, and sometimes if you find that a teacher's framing of things doesn't work, you can try to see like how other teachers um, explain it and that would um, help your understanding. Thank you might interest you um the term ego you know of course uh comes from the latin and it was um made current by freud um what trump Rinpoche adopted it to talk about what in buddhism or in the sanskrit is called the you know the self uh the atman which is variously translated as well. It's also translated as soul, um, self, and it's enduring and it's it's uh, it's permanent. It's eternal, the Atman, and there are all kinds of philosophies about it. If you, for your amusement, it might, you know, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is an etymological dictionary, it shows the roots of words, where they came from gives you the history of where a word came from. And if you go to the word egolessness, they attribute it to Trumper Rinpoche. <laughs> he coined it. Wow. <laughs> cool. he, was, he was looking for a way, looking for words to get across Buddhist ideas. And it's core, core in Buddhism, that the self does not exist, that it's a fiction, that it's a myth in which we have become embroiled and to which we are enslaved and which dominates our life this constant concern with i me this and 
the fact that he used this term ego, which is, you know, the Freudian term for I, he Freud coined it. It's just, he, he, he was looking for Western language to translate the Tibetan or the Sanskrit. Then another way you may want to look at it is it, it's it's not a as your friend was was talking about it's not a um, dissolution of our uh, in the sense of the ego that she was referring it to it it's not a dissolution of our of our way of interacting with the world that keeps you know that is pragmatic you know the ego for freud was an adaptive structure uh, he actually refers to it as a structure and which goes to the next point what egolessness is about is the is is the understanding of the misconception that it there is some inherent self-existing structure of uh, called i right or ego, right? And one way just to look at that is if just the simple contemplations that we've been discussing recently, also in the other class, is is just when you have the experience of I want to do this, when it occurs to you, take a moment and try to identify what that I is in terms of a its inherent existence, right? or what that sense of self is, what that self is that we think. Just just a quick contemplation when you feel that, you know, that that sense of I, you know, either followed by something, whatever, possessive or whatever. Just try to identify what the I is. Try to find mm -hmm. it. I would like to reinforce that because that's exactly what Shin Yi is saying, and that's exactly what um, Barry was saying a couple of days ago, that words and concepts are not going to get you where you want to go. This is, at its core, experiential, and you have to understand it in a totally different way. Um, so what Dan is suggesting, whenever you're aware of something, ask yourself, who is aware? What is aware? Spend some time wondering what awareness is like. Does it have a color or a shape? How does it exist in time? How does it exist in space? Is it individual to you? Is it within your body? Does it extend beyond your skin? Is your awareness different from Dan's awareness? Um, that's part of what it's about. And that is, and that is very possibly where and how I'm getting tripped up because I'm so new at this. And it's like, you know, I like to think I'm so smart and, you know, you know, and, you know, I, it's like, but it's like, wow, it's like the imperfection of words. And I'm definitely learning a lot about how something is experienced in my body is very, very different from how it's experienced in my mind or in my brain. So that that really resonates of words are a vehicle to try to get us to a certain place, but it's 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 imperfect. So I'll get it when I live it or when it happens to me or when I, you know, summon it or something. So yeah. it's like touching a hot wood stove. <laughs> I hand raised for a while here. Yeah, um, I think a lot of us struggle with this idea of uh, non-self, and I think the the Buddhist arguments are uh, compelling. I it, it makes sense that to try and trace back this I, it's um, it becomes you know impossible. Yet we have an experience of I and me, and you know. I think it's very difficult to, um, it's not an all or nothing, 
going from a position of self-referential thinking to not thinking about ourselves. But so I just came across a study that was done on meditators. And I think that helps to illuminate this kind of dilemma of experiencing ourselves as an entity with an eye, meaning I'm going to go to the store or I want to make sure that, you know, my kids don't go hungry. I, it, we do, I find that it happens all the time. And when you look at meditators versus non-meditators, you know, there's a region of the brain called the default node network, which is operating all the time, when, especially when we're on automatic pilot, involves thoughts related to the self. And when you examine, you know, meditators with experience, they still activate that part of their brain. But in their experiences, especially with instructions of staying in the moment and experience uh, awareness in the moment, then there's more distributed activation throughout the brain. In other words, they go out of that self-referential process. They don't try and fit everything into it. They seem to show patterns that are much more broadly distributed towards the brain. And I think that's been replicated with meditation, certain areas of the brain, the somatosensory areas are more developed, meaning that you sense things in a bodily sense in a more subtle way. And, and that allows us to be free from concepts because every subtlety is kind of new and it doesn't fit neatly into the previous packages that we have around how the world works that we took so long to build, right? And so the thing for me was that the experienced meditators still had some activation in the midline cortical region, which whatever is the default mode network it, with self-referential thoughts, it still occurs, but there's also a broadening of experiences. So I, Anyway, I think it, it's not black and white. I think we shift back and forth. We just, I think when we get caught in the na narrative of the self, it's good to catch yourself early before you get trapped into, you know, some drama of some sort. That's samsara, you know? Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I think um. It's, I want to make something very clear. It's important to know what is being meant by ego or I. And it is defined, especially in Sultan Gatso's book. Um, he doesn't mention the term svababa, which means own being. That's, but that's mentioned in lots of other places. And the idea is that we normally attribute this quality of svababa, own being, to I and to other. And what it has is three essential aspects. The first um, is that what is given own being, like an I, endures through time. And what the Buddhist teachings say is that nothing endures. Everything is a constant arising and passing in the moment. There's nothing that you can find that lasts. And yet we attribute lastingness to I. That's, that's part of Svabhava. The second quality of Svabhava that's denied is that it's one thing. We are not one thing. We're many things. We're constantly accruing and changing and losing and gaining and all kinds of things. We're a collection that's constantly changing. And then the third quality of Svabhava is that it's independent. And again, we and the whole world is utterly interdependent. Everything is arising and passing in dependence on everything else. So in this moment, this screen, the sound, the colors, everything is changing instant by instant, interpenetrating, working on each other, you know, are, are the sounds and the vision. So that what is being denied when we talk about egolessness is svabhava, 
what's, what's being done is that the eye is ongoing, permanent, at least for some period of time, and it isn't, it's constantly in flux, that it's one thing, it's not one thing, it's a million things. We're all different, you know, collections of things, and that it's independent of everything else, which is not. We're constantly in conversation, as it were. So remember those three things that are being denied. And when we talk about egolessness, you're coming into a space where none of that is true, where nothing endures, where everything is utterly in, in, in independent, independent on everything else, and nothing is single. Everything is multiple to the point of infinity. Different world. Mm -hmm. Ungraspable world. Sarah. I just wanted to offer this um, interesting practice. Uh, Don actually introduced me to this podcast called Wisdom of the Masters. And I don't know which episode, it was one recently, um, where the contemplation is while you're meditating, just ask yourself, who's meditating? And the answer is, I'm meditating. But it's so powerful. It's so interesting. Like, wait a minute, who is that? Um, I, I just offer that as something to try because it's so simple yet so profound um and you can also just while you're walking ask who's walking <laughs> i'm walking and then where does that go <laughs> thanks Thank a lot of people haven't spoken you have a few couple minutes left i'm trying to see if i recognize anybody Fun. Thanks for the uh, teaching. This is very, uh, very, very good. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a lot of things in this uh, to be discussed. There's so much, uh, so much to it. Um, I just want to say that uh, about the loneliness or uh, aloneness. Um, I usually consider myself as pretty uh, quiet. I don't go out to parties or have to meet other people. So usually very uh, comfortable just by myself. But when I do more meditation, actually I find myself there is an undercurrent of restlessness that's very... Um, uh, very strong, actually. So there is a, uh, after you sit quiet, you have a long period of a quiet time, and then you'll be coming out and you'll be thinking about having some food to eat or have some drinks or maybe check the emails or look at things. Uh, I just find myself, there is a very, um, when I do all these things, if you don't think about it, it's like automatic, this is what I do. But actually, if you, if I look deeper, there is um, uh, using all those stimulations to, to avoid experiencing this underlying restlessness, uh, which, is, which is coming from the self that wants to claim its existence it's very unsafe if you don't keep stimulating it and if you keep quiet the spaciousness then the self doesn't exist so it has to claim its existence by all the stimulation that, that keeps going uh, that's why there is uh, entertainment it's so popular you know everybody um, needing so much stimulation of all kinds, very complicated. So we developed this very complicated system to to try to solidify this self, sense of self. So there's plenty to look into. 
Right there. That's all. Well, we're at time. So, shall we do the closing chats? Thank you, Kwan. Don, you ready? Yes. Wonderful discussion. Thank you all. By the blessings of enlightened and compassionate ones, by the power of my positive actions of three times and my prayers of pure aspiration, may wars, conflicts, epidemics, and all other maladies dissolve in this world, and may the earth and all who live on this earth enjoy the abundance of well-being. May all learn to live lovingly with each other. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy, wrongdoing, from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you, Don. Dan, Shen Yi. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Dan, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Good night. Take care, everyone. Good night.